All right, we are going to begin talking about Trails West. And as we talk about Trails West, this is how people traveled from the eastern United States all the way over to the uh, Pacific Coast, including Oregon and the California Gold Coast. So as we start talking, we need to first talk about the Cumberland Gap. The Cumberland Gap is going to be where people are led through a gap in the mountains going from Maryland to the Ohio Territory and on the other side of the Ohio River. They're going to be led by Daniel Boone. They're going to originally cut this trail through uh, the Appalachian Mountains. Okay, And as they cut this trail through the Appalachian Mountains, they are going to allow enormous amounts of settlers into the Kentucky and the Ohio territories. These settlers are eventually going to become um, known as frontier, but this will change as the west of the United States expands further. Okay, from Daniel Boone and the Cumberland Gap, we are now going to start talking about upstream travel on the Missouri River. The Missouri River met up with the Mississippi River near St. Louis, Missouri, okay? And it took until the invention or the application of Robert Fulton's steam engine. Originally starting off near the Hudson River Valley, but it takes Robert Fulton's steam engine being applied to a boat, so a steamboat, in order to travel upstream. It was extremely difficult to travel upstream prior to this. Um, Lewis and Clark actually had to use teams of men to pull their boats up the Missouri River in an effort to find the Northwest Passage. Okay, this is a quick overview of travel to the West. We move on to trails of John C. Fremont. John C. Fremont was tasked with finding routes to the west that settlers could use, and he found a lot. He traveled consistently throughout the western area, and here are but a few of the trails that John C. Fremont would find. Fremont used the same kind of pathways that Lewis and Clark had, and Fremont used the Missouri River, the Platte River Valleys, and the Sweetwater River Valleys to explore near Wyoming and Idaho. As he explored near Wyoming and Idaho, he eventually came to the Oregon Territory. Oregon was being, quote-unquote, shared by the British and the United States during the time. And the Oregon Territory set up a very good opportunity for people looking to use those fertile river valleys for farming. After the Oregon Trail, there are a number of groups that also are moving for religious freedom, like the Mormons, who are going to move down here to the Beehive State, Utah, in order to set up their own um, Zion. So we have the Mormon Trail that is also going to follow in the footsteps of John C. Fremont. Eventually, we are going to have people going through Utah, through Oregon, and they are going to start settling the southwestern Pacific corner of the United States, the California Trail. To get there, To the valleys of California would have been a difficult journey, to say the least, and some of them ended up trying to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert and the Great Basin region, a region that doesn't have any water. They had to cross the Sierra Nevada Mountains. Some people did meet their doom on this journey, like the Donner Party, who um, unfortunately didn't have to resort to cannibalism for some of them to survive. John C. Fremont's California, Oregon, and Mormon trails kind of like laid the groundwork for a huge influx of people moving west after we had the California gold rush. There are going to be people coming from the coast and 
cities like San Francisco are going to grow exponentially. But the gold rush kicks off a humongous exodus of people rushing to California seeking their fortune. Not all of them gained a fortune. Some of them did, but more so by people like Levi Strauss, who developed denim jeans that the miners could use versus finding a fortune in gold. After the California gold rush, we're going to start talking about the introduction of railroads and how life starts changing in the West. Railroads had begun with the very simplified tracks of the Ohio B&O. And the Ohio B&O went from Baltimore to Ohio. The Baltimore to Ohio Railroad was trying to compete with some of the canals like the Erie Canal, as well as some of the um, other main thoroughfares like the Chesapeake to Ohio canals going between the frontier and the eastern United States. The Baltimore to Ohio was the first long distance rail in the United States. And it was with Baltimore to Ohio that they started to standardize the size of the rail so that trains could travel more easily and connect and be able to travel the length of the country. So after the B and O, we're going to get to talking about the length of the country by rail. We shift over to Utah once again at Promontory Summit. Or promontory point, doesn't really matter how we say it. And, but at Promontory Summit in 1869, the Union Pacific Rail and the uh, rail from the eastern side of the United States joined at the commemoration of the Golden Spike. So, Rails were joined. This sets off the Transcontinental Railroad. All right. After the Transcontinental Railroad is completed, the wagon trains of old following Fremont's original footsteps kind of begin to die down because people can easily get products as well as themselves into the West. And one of those large products during this time is going to be the cattle industry. People's uh, desire to eat beef and put that on the table has grown. And so this area of the Southwest, including Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas begins to have a large impact on the beef industry. There is going to be a number of trails, but it all begins with the Chisholm Trail, which went between Kansas and Texas, shipping large amounts of beef held in ranches, and this, these beef would go from the ranches to the railways waiting to ship the beef to the plates of hungry Easterners. All right. We have gone through a quick overview of Trails West. Um, as always, ask any questions if you have them, but there we go.